Welcome to Fertility Help Hub's podcast. I'm Eloise, the founder and editor, and each week we bring you expert interviews, reader stories, holistic products, and more. Subscribe to our podcast for free so you never miss an episode. Welcome. This morning I have the pleasure of speaking with Professor John Wass, who is the Professor of Endocrinology at Oxford University, and he specializes in reproductive hormones. He also carries out a lot of research. Good morning and welcome, John. Good morning, Eloise. Nice to be here. Thank you very much for coming on. We're going to go through some extremely important information and topics this morning. So I think the first thing that we were going to talk about was around, for for females, for women out there, ovulation. Could you just start by talking about what is ovulation and when it occurs? Okay, so obviously this is key. Um, Ovulation occurs in the middle of a cycle. So if you take day one of the period as day one of the menstrual cycle, ovulation in somebody who's having 28 day cycles, which is the commonest length, occurs around day 14. And that's where the hormones build up and actually make uh, the ovum, that's the egg, come out of the ovary to be fertilized. And that's what ovulation is. And uh, it occurs, as I say, around day 14. If the cycle is 30 days, for example, it usually occurs 14 days before the next period. So in a 30-day cycle, for example, the ovulation period time will be not day 14, but day 16. And um, of course, every cycle is different. But for people who are tracking their cycle, trying to conceive naturally, what are signs that people can look out for? Okay, so uh, some people get mid-cycle pain uh, or discomfort in the pelvis. Uh, That's possibly related to a small amount of bleeding which goes into the the tummy, into the abdomen. Uh, Then after ovulation, uh, there are various things that can happen. You can get some lower abdominal discomfort. Uh, You can get breast Uh, swelling or discomfort and those are both caused by progesterone in the second half of the cycle progesterone is made which actually thickens the lining of the uterus to accept a fertilized ovum and so the effects of progesterone lower abdominal pain or discomfort uh, breast increased tenderness uh, and in fact sometimes you can get acne in the second half of the cycle again that's a progesterone effect and so those are some of the uh, 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 sort of signs of ovulation which you can make uh, see uh, which actually are important so that you know you're ovulating and therefore are fertile and what about cervical mucus because that's something that's talked about a lot within the trying to conceive community for people who are tracking and monitoring their cycles at home yes okay so cervical mucus comes around the middle of the cycle uh, and you can you can you can detect this uh, so that's some, another sign of uh, of ovulation and then you're talking about um the second half of the cycle the luteal phase could you talk a bit about the meaning of this and the length because I know personally, when I was trying to conceive naturally and it wasn't happening, um, it was actually male factor issues. But I was always looking at the length of the luteal phase and worrying that it was perhaps too short. OK, so there are various issues there. So the luteal phase is the phase where after ovulation in a 28 day cycle at day 14, the uh, progesterone is increasingly secreted, which thickens the lining of the uterus, as I just said. Now, that is usually 14 days. Some people have a a shortened luteal phase and you can tell this by measuring progesterone in the luteal phase phase usually around days 19 to 21 uh, uh, and sometimes if you're worried and the temp because you, this is also associated with a rise in temperature during the second half of the cycle the luteal phase if it goes down too shortly before day 28 uh, then you can suspect that there's a shortened luteal phase which means that there's less likelihood of implantation of the fertilized ovum and you can tell that by second progesterone measurements nearer the end of the luteal phase and so although it's not particularly common some people do have a shortened luteal phase which impairs their their fertility 
And what about the causes of that? Well, sometimes, I mean, I think that there are various hormones, which are stress hormones, which can actually shorten it. And one of those, and we'll talk about that later, I think, is prolactin. And so uh, if there's a lot of stress around, for example, and I think this can be, if you want to get pregnant and can't, this can be a very stressful aspect of your life. Uh, and this is something which, again, we could talk about later if you want, uh, sort of obviating the stress of it all. And I often say to patients, you know, if you're trying to get pregnant uh, and all the hormones are okay and the sperm counts are okay and the tubes are okay, go off to Paris and have a nice weekend together. And with the progesterone, as you were just saying, um, that's obviously why it's so important with an IVF cycle, for example, to continue taking the medication that you're prescribed, um, even if you test early yeah. and don't think that you have got a positive outcome, um, you know, in case, in case the test that you may have done at home is incorrect. Yes, I think that's correct. You should take, carry on taking the medication. And um, a big topic that I know that you uh, want to talk about today is thyroid and trying to conceive. Is it hereditary? Yeah, well, that's a very important thing because underactivity of the thyroid is a very common thing, and I'm afraid it's commoner in women. So the answer is that thyroid disease is hereditary. And so often in people who have an underactive thyroid, which we call hypothyroidism, and it's sometimes called Hashimoto's thyroiditis, uh, these people actually uh, have a six times increased risk of having a relative with it. So if I see a young woman with hypothyroidism, they will more likely than not have a family member a uh, sister or a mother or a grandmother with hypothyroidism. So thyroid disease is a strongly genetic disease. And we don't quite understand how the genes affect the thyroid, but what happens in the thyroid is that the uh, thyroid, uh, the body makes antibodies to thyroid tissue, which means that it swells up uh, and uh, minorly, not majorly, uh, but also becomes inflamed. Doesn't, that doesn't hurt, but that results in an underactivity of the thyroid. And is it easy to treat it? It is easy to treat it, but it is important that it's diagnosed because I think it's fair to say that a lot of thyroid disease is missed often for years before I, before I see a patient. And if you look back in their records, their thyroid hormone levels haven't been normal. So there's some important aspects here. This is quite factual and numerical, but if your thyroid hormone is underactive, the normal range of TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone, which is the hormone which comes from the pituitary, uh, and that stimulates the thyroid. And there's a sort of servo loop system whereby the TSH, the thyroid stimulating hormone from the pituitary, stimulates the thyroid, which then produces thyroid hormones. And these in the blood feed back to the pituitary to inhibit TSH. And if the TSH is high, then that means that the patient has hypothyroidism, the thyroid's not working properly. But the important aspect of this is that the normal range of TSH is about 0.5 to 4. And in fact, uh, the normal range of TSH in people who are underactive uh, is importantly lower than the upper limit of normal. So if you've got somebody on thyroid hormone, the TSH should be 2.5 or less. And this is something which means that a lot of people who have mild thyroid disease go untreated if their TSH is four or five or something very, very marginally elevated. These people can firstly have a much improved quality of life by treating their thyroid and thyroid hormone is a normally occurring substance, which means that it's not gonna cause any side effects provided you get the dose right. Uh, but not only do they feel better if they've got very mild underactivity of the thyroid, but their fertility is improved as well. And therefore, in any person, any woman who has a fertility issue, it's absolutely imperative that their thyroid hormones are uh, measured uh, and seen to be normal. But if it has been diagnosed as being slightly high, is it something that can be lowered through, is it lowered through Western medicine or can it be done through diet or a combination? Oh, no, no, you give that. If, if the TSH is high, then the, uh, t the simple treatment is to give thyroid hormone and you have to take it first thing in the morning on an empty stomach. But provided you give enough, the TSH will come down to normal and the uh, improved uh, quality of life is there as well as the improved fertility. 
And then I think it's fair to say that if you are, because this is significant, quite a significant number of people that have an underactive thyroid, if you have an underactive thyroid and you're trying to get pregnant, so firstly, if you're trying to get pregnant and you do, if you're thought to be normal, you check your thyroid. But secondly, if you're already known to have a thyroid which is underactive, it's really important to keep an eye on this. Firstly, uh, when you want to get pregnant to make sure that it's adequately treated. And secondly, when you get pregnant, it's absolutely essential that you keep an eye on the thyroid function tests because uh, this is something which is very clear clear that the fetus doesn't develop its own thyroid for the first three months of a pregnancy. And therefore, you need to give, uh, make sure that the thyroid hormone levels are okay by measuring them monthly in the first three months of the pregnancy. Uh, and it also, you need to increase the dose of thyroxine. So if you're a mother who's just got pregnant, you should increase the dose of thyroxine, usually by 25 micrograms, uh, so that you can make sure that the thyroid balance is okay and this is important uh, because the fetal brain is developing and you need to have more levels of thyroid hormone to optimize fetal brain development and that's why that's important in the first three months so to just quickly go through that again if you're un if you're infertile you need to check your thyroid if you're infertile and you are on thyroxine you need to put your dose of thyroid hormone up when you become pregnant and you need to measure your thyroid hormone levels every month during the first three months of the pregnancy before the baby's thyroid is properly formed it's not actually widely appreciated this if i may say so eloise it's not widely appreciated and everybody doesn't realize how important this is in the first part of pregnancy so i think that's something which patients should be empowered by knowing these facts Absolutely, absolutely. And um, of course, uh, the medication that you've just mentioned um, needs to be looked at. But is there, are there things that people can do with their lifestyle as well to help it? To help their thyroid? Yes. Um, I think I think their lifestyle, I mean, it is important. I mean, this is general. It's nothing to do with the thyroid. But I do think it's important to think, you know, because as a doctor, you need to be a doctor to the whole person, not just their fertility, not just their thyroid. And when I've got somebody who's having a, a fertility problem, let's say, you need to talk through their work, their relationships, their life work balance and everything, because undoubtedly stress adversely affects fertility. Uh, and I think that as a whole holistic doctor, if you like, you need to think through all aspects of a person's life, their family life, their work life and everything else to try and make them think uh, together with their doctor or whoever that uh, they can, as much as it's possible, de-stress themselves, which, as I say, through various hormones, including prolactin and steroid hormones as well, can interfere with fertility. And these stress hormones therefore interfere with implantation of the fertilized ovum. Absolutely. Thank you for clarifying that. Now, let's talk a little bit about PCOS and Clomid. Would you mind just explaining a bit more about PCOS? Polycystic, yeah. um, this is a very important topic. Yes. And again, it's because thyroid disease is common in young women, and so is PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome. And what is polycystic ovary syndrome? Polycystic ovary syndrome is a common thing which occurs in one in 10 women in the reproductive phases of their lives. And what it is, it simply describes the anatomical appearance of the ovaries, which are normally smooth in their outline. And if you do an ultrasound on a woman with polycystic ovary syndrome, then they have uh, little cysts on them. How does this affect people? Well, from the usually from an early age, people with polycystic ovary syndrome are, have irregular periods, and that's important because uh, they mean that means that they don't ovulate as normal as normally frequently as possible. And then there are other aspects of the polycystic ovary syndrome. Number one, uh, besides uh, what we call oligomenorrhea, irregular periods, they may have a tendency to put on weight. Uh, they tend to be insulin resistant. Uh, they may have a tendency to grow slightly excessive hair on their moustache area or around the nipples or up from the straight line of the pubic hair up to the um, umbilicus. So they may have a slight excessive hair. They may have oily skin. They may have acne. So there are a lot of different manifestations. Not everybody has all of these, but there are a lot of different manifestations. 
The other thing which is important is that polycystic ovary syndrome is largely a genetic thing. So if you have a mother who had polycystic ovary syndrome, it's more likely you'll get it. And often if you go into the family history, uh, that's the case, that people who have polycystic ovary syndrome uh, are more likely to have a family history. And then the next thing that's important is that actually people who have polycystic ovary syndrome, and if you see a young woman, let's say 17 or 18, who's having irregular periods, and the question is why are they having irregular periods and polycystic ovary syndrome is the answer, then they will be worrying about whether they can have children easily in the future, or they may do, they may not at all, but they may do. So you have to address this proactively and say, you know, this, these are the facts. And the facts are, that if you have polycystic ovary syndrome, and this is important so that people don't spend their lives worrying about it, 80% of people who have polycystic ovary syndrome are pregnant at the end of a year when they want to get pregnant. So it's not, it's not necessarily associated with significant infertility. It's something which can be helped. And then the next thing, can I go on to talk a little bit about clomiphene or clomid? Yes, please do, please do. Okay, so the, the treatment of, uh, of infertility with, with uh, polycystic ovary syndrome is often clomiphene or clomid as it's called. And clomiphene, I won't go into the exact details, but basically clomiphene stimulates the pituitary to produce the hormones which stimulate the ovary to make, you, make a person ovulate. And what you need to do here is be very careful because you can overstimulate the ovary and so you usually start with a low dose and then work up uh, and this is a, a successful treatment of people who have oligomenorrhea that's irregular or uh, irregular periods uh, and that can help them to ovulate and then become pregnant and so at the same time you give them clomiphene you need to make sure the husband's sperm counts okay before you give clomiphene you need to make sure that the tubes are patent before you give clomiphene and then when all that's done and you've done it you've got a package of a fertile couple otherwise then you can give clomiphene and provided it's carefully monitored and you work the dose up fairly slowly and don't overstimulate them because you can get you know if you overstimulate them you can get twins and multiple births which is probably more risky uh, then then that's the way to deal with clomiphene and it's it's very successful treatment thank you for clarifying that how about prolactin levels and implantation okay so prolactin from the latin lact lactate is the lip of the milk hormone and it comes normally speaking from the pituitary now it's a very interesting hormone you can get tumors and tiny little tumors of the pituitary which make too much prolactin which usually result in absent periods but prolactin is also a stress hormone and it's very interesting actually so that when the nipple is being stimulated uh, for any reason the prolactin level goes up it therefore goes up often during sexual intercourse but it also can go up during stress and so if you are very stressed, say you're being chased around the field by a bull and you measure prolactin at the end of the run, uh, your prolactin level will be up. So it's a stress hormone. How does prolactin work to interfere with fertility? And it uh, does this by impairing the implantation of the fertilized ovum. So if you've got a, a person who's got a mild small pituitary enlargement causing high prolactin levels that's how that works but also if you're stressed and this is what i was talking about earlier and stress and fertility if you're stressed the prolactin level can go up and so i think that it's another reason why you need to make sure that the prolactin level before you start treatment for fertility you need to make sure the prolactin level is normal and therefore uh, that you're or optimizing implantation chances and if it's slightly high there are drugs which are very easy to give you give them once a week you can they're very long lasting in terms of their effect uh, and these can actually help implantation so sometimes you'll give prolactin to somebody who has a mild elevation of the prolactin and that can help them get pregnant wonderful thank you for telling us more about that and lastly we're going to talk a bit about male infertility and as you know, because I actually talked to you about this at the time, five years ago, that was uh, mine and my husband's diagnosis. Could you tell us a little bit more about uh, the causes, the symptoms and the treatment of male infertility with HCG? So I'm afraid there are quite a lot of different causes of infer male infertility. 
Um, so uh, there are various genetic things. It's important to examine the person in, involved uh, because, for example, there is a chromosomal thing which uh, some people know about called Kleinfelter's syndrome. And in these people, the testicles don't develop normally. It's a chromosomal thing uh, where there's an extra X chromosome. They're perfectly normal otherwise, but actually the testicles don't develop normally and spermatogenesis doesn't develop normally. Mostly they have a normal testicle but that's not always the case. And so the physician who's seeing a couple who want to get pregnant should examine the male as well as the female. Another possible cause of mild subfertility often is a varicocele. And this is something which you can see when you examine the scrotum of a person who's got one, and it's like a varicose vein around the testicle. Uh, and what these are is uh, things which actually therefore warm the testicle up. Uh, and you probably know that the testicle is one degree centigrade uh, lower in its temperature than the rest of the body. And this uh, maximizes spermatogenesis. And so if you have a varicose vein around the testicle, this may interfere with spermatogenesis. And so another cause of male infertility is a varicocele. It new, normally doesn't cause absent sperm, but it does cause less uh, frequent sperm and also lowers motility of the sperm. And so this is something which is slightly controversial, but a lot of people will want to treat a varicocele, and you can do this quite simply now by giving an injection to clot the vein. And so that's another cause of male infertility. I'm afraid there are lots of different other causes of male infertility. This is usually the remit of some specialist endocrinologists or urologists who actually specialize in male infertility. If you have Kleinfelter syndrome, you can actually extract sperm. Not always is it successful, but you can. Uh, and then the other thing to be clear about is that with Kleinfelter syndrome, you can use donor sperm with the girlfriend or wife's uh, ova and actually have a normal pregnancy through a fertilized ovum that way. And so there are a lot of nowadays very positive outcomes to these, these aspects of um, problems which you can see with male infertility. And then I, because I have a special interest in pituitary tumors, see a lot of people who have pituitary tumors which cause their infertility. The pituitary becomes underactive and so the the hormones coming from the pituitary which stimulate the testicle uh, doesn't don't work properly and therefore you need to give exogenous hormones uh, to s induce spermatogenesis and so with some people with pituitary tumors uh, you can give them uh, the hormones which actually the pituitary makes by injection and then after three months these produce normal sperm and then very usually very successfully these people can actually father children that's fascinating thank you for going into that i know it's a huge huge topic it's a huge topic. <laughs> we're not going to cover it in two minutes but thank you for just laying out some of the basics there um and and you're right that's actually how we we my husband and i ended up becoming parents through donor sperm um following his unsuccessful sperm retrievals uh, due to kleinfelter syndrome so absolutely there are other, other options out there um if it feels suitable and comfortable for the couple or the person there's one other thing which I think is worth talking about from the hormonal point of view, Eloise, which we hadn't talked to, agreed to talk about, and that's exercise. And I see quite a lot of people now, uh, and uh, this is important because excessive exercise can interfere with fertility. Uh, and so if you're very, uh, if you're very, very slim or you take a huge amount of exercise, that can actually interfere with your ovulation process because there's not enough adipose tissue. And I see quite a lot of people nowadays who actually seem to be, well, and there's a medical recognition of this, addicted to exercise. And so I always go into the amount of exercise a person takes if they're trying to conceive, because sometimes they take excessive amounts of exercise. If you look, I'm very interested in the arts. And so if you look at the corps de ballet at Covent Garden, only 25% of those women who are exercising a huge amount, obviously, have normal regular periods because they are advised to be very slim uh, and so on and so forth. So I think that another thing we haven't talked about, which is really important in somebody who wants to have fertility, is to make sure that they're not exercising too much uh, and in, this interferes with ovulation. Absolutely. I think that's a great point. There's definitely a balance, isn't there? There is. Indeed, there is. 
Thank you very, very much, um, Professor Walsh, for coming on today. And um, I have put into the podcast here how people can contact you if they would like to seek some help from you. So thank you very, very much for your time. Well, it's a real pleasure, Eloise, because it's a very important aspect. And, you know, one of the joys of being an endocrinologist is that you can cause huge uh, huge uh, enjoyment in life because I think I've got this lovely book at home and I brought it home and it said in the front, thank you for my lovely baby. And I showed it to my wife and she said, what the dickens have you been up to? Uh, and basically um, it's something which, you know, you can cause a huge amount of joy and happiness by helping a couple to get pregnant as well as you know. Uh, and I think therefore being an endocrinologist, because I don't deal with cancer and old age and things, I deal with some of these things where you can hugely improve somebody's quality of life. And therefore it's a deeply satisfying specialty that I'm in.